episode of all things theology where this is your host k-dub and today today man we we gotta talk about it you know they saying there's beef out here in these youtube streets no, 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 no. boy ain't no way boy boy ain't no way boy a lot of people want me to come at this with drama so you know we gotta play the drama field music right oh yeah <laughs> Oh yeah. There's no drama. There is no drama at all. Yes! Randy Watson! <laughs> that boy is good. <laughs> yeah, so what I want everybody right now, because I know he said he's going to be watching. My brother Corey said he's going to be watching. So why don't everybody put Corey Miner in the chat? Go to wave at Corey Miner. What's up, bro? Good to see you. We gotta talk about it. I just got off the phone with Corey not too long ago. And um, we had a talk. We had a talk. I told him I disagree. We had a good brotherly dialogue. And most of it was cordial. I say most of it. All of it was cordial, right? Uh, Corey's a pretty uh, mild mannered guy. And uh, we had a discussion. I told him, hey, I don't think it was wise to call Marcus brother on the chat. And he said, hey, well, I actually didn't say that. I thought I did hear that. Y'all let me know. But I thought I did hear that. But he said, hey, what I said was I'm going to treat Marcus Rogers like a uh, brother. Um, I'm going to be hopeful. Um, he's like, I'm not putting my life on. I'm not gambling. He's like, if you put a gun in my head, what do I think? Yeah, I probably say no, he's not a Christian. But here's my general take. If I know someone, I've known their doctrine. I know their theology. I know their character. <sighs> I'm, I'm not going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Now, if somebody I don't know, they say, hey, I'm a Christian, I'll call them brother, right? I'll call them brother. And I'll give them the benefit of the doubt because I don't know your theology until you make it known to me. But that's kind of different with Marcus, right? We know his theology. We know the false prophecies. We know the things like that. And let me just say this. Pers on a personal level, I, I like Marcus. I mean, behind closed doors, Marcus is actually kind of likable. Um, it's just the theology that bring that wedges that gap. And so that's what I wanted to say. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like my brother, uh, Rick said, uh, yeah, he said, treat you like a brother, but it is very confusing language. It, it, and I think so too. I think so too. And we're going to see why once we get into some of these clips and talk about it, um, 
Again, you want to stay to the end because we got a surprise. For those who are watching live, we have a surprise at the end. You have a way to contribute to today's show. So you want to stick around. Go on and hit that like button, things like that. And so without further ado, let's actually get into the first clip, the first issue at hand. And the first thing that was discussed was the issue of the Trinity. Uh, so let's hear this. So the question is, does Marcus, and let's just, and, and this is what I did with Marcus. I said, Marcus, I'm, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to do you one favor because I believe this. Uh, listening to him and his discussion about the identity of Christ, I'm of the opinion, uh, now, maybe I misheard him, so I'm going to ask him again in front of you guys so that we can go ahead and put this issue to, to, to side, uh, this issue about the Trinity, uh, whether you use the word Trinity or not. Again, it's not it's not a, a, a biblical word, but then again, there's a lot of words we use, every English word, none of it's in the Bible. But So I asked Marcus these questions, I'm going to ask Marcus this now, and that'll be kind of our, our jumping point. Marcus. How you ask, answer this question this, uh, this morning, you believe Jesus is God, right? Yes, sir. You believe that Jesus is the Lord. Yes, sir. And you believe the Lord is God, according to Deuteronomy 4, 35, 39. Yes, sir. And we have one Lord, one God. Uh, yes, sir. Ephesians 4. Yes, sir. And then God says that there is no other Lord and no other Savior besides him. And you agree with that, right? Yes, sir. And so if Jesus is the Lord and you must confess that Jesus is the Lord for salvation, you are in agreement with that, right? Yes, sir. You believe that the, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are distinct? Yes, sir. The only, and the only thing I, I would say about... Now, I want you to listen to all those questions that were asked. And all the questions were questions, except the last one. But this is the one Marcus actually kind of tries to modify on a little bit. All the questions were... Something a um, a modalist could agree on is Jesus God. A modalist, a oneness perspective, could agree on that. Is Jesus Lord? All those things, you know. So, um, <laughs> you know, all those things as a modalist could agree with. I, I want, I want to let me. I want to go back. I want to go back. Just and I want to go frame by frame, just so you can see uh, the issue. Um, Melissa says you feel bad for Marcus in a way. I kind of do too, and I'm actually going to play something that made me kind of feel bad for him. I mean, this isn't just to feel bad for Marcus. We want to actually deal with the issues, right? But let's go back and hear some of these questions. And we have one Lord, one God. Hold on a second. Do you believe that Jesus is the Lord? So he asked, do you believe Jesus is God? Now he's asking, is Jesus the Lord? Again, a modalist would affirm every, all, all that, all that. Modalists agree Jesus is God. Right. Because they believe Jesus is the father. So, of course, they believe him. You know, now there are some distinct uh, modalists who would, you know, have some kind of, well, the son is not God. Again, the, modalism kind of gets quite confusing when answering some of these questions. But generally speaking, they would say he Jesus is God. Jesus is the Lord. Um, let's go to this next question, sir. And you believe the Lord is God, according to Deuteronomy 4, 35, 39. And the Lord is God. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. They, they would believe that as well. Yes, sir. And we have one Lord, one God. And he's going to say, yes, we have one Lord, one God. Yes. They would agree with that as well. Every every modalist so far would say, yep, yep, yep. Every, every one of these questions. You're right. Uh, yes, sir. Ephesians 4. Yes, sir. And then God says that there is no other Lord and no other Savior besides him. And you agree with that, right? Yeah. Uh, there's no other Lord, no other Savior. Yep. They would all agree. They would all agree. Yep. Cephas says it's semantics. No, it's not semantics. It isn't the Trinity verse one is it's not semantics. Uh, I would disagree with that, sir. And so if Jesus is the Lord and you must confess that Jesus is the Lord for salvation, you are in agreement with that, right? Yes, sir. You so confessing Jesus as the Lord for salvation. Again, every moment, every modalist would agree with that as well. Believe that the, the, the father, the son and the Holy Spirit are distinct. Yes, sir. The only, and the only thing I always now to elaborate more on, right? Um, if you've ever heard Marcus' view of God, it is very confusing. I'm not, and let me just say this: I'm not quite sure Marcus even understands his view of God. If you want to demonstrate, if you want to hear that or see that demonstrate, go watch the video he did with William Jackson, where he's in the room and they literally have knives and papers and slinkies and boxes trying to describe God. It, it is one of the most confusing and bizarre doctrines of God teachings that I've, I have ever heard. And I, and I talked to Corey this morning, morning, and I said, I think Marcus is actually confused 
and and by his confusion, he he thus teaches heretical issues, and layer that on his background of one one is Pentecostalism, right? And Corey actually agree. Yeah, I, I totally agree with what you're saying, right? And so, which is exactly why I would not have confessed him as, or say I would treat him like a brother, right? Because Marcus is so confused, which which also demonstrates he should not be a pastor, right? Um, I'll get more into some conversations I had with Marcus. I, I do want to tread lightly because those things were had in private. And so I'm not one of those uh, <laughs> record your conversations, guys, you know, and put them online. No, 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 no. We don't do that right here, right? We we, we want to be honorable. But yeah, I talked to Corey, Corey earlier today. Can we talk for a minute? The Bible says. We had a good conversation, right? And I pushed back on some things. He pushed back and, I, you know, I tell him, hey, why I don't think. Right. If the Bible tells us to mark false teachings and false teachers, I don't think they should be given the benefit of the doubt and saying, well, I'm just going to treat them like a brother. I mean, until what? I, I guess I would want to know until the what? Because, I mean, Marcus, Marcus doesn't just have troubling issues on the doctrine of on the doctrine of God. Right. That would be one thing if he was just confused. Right. OK, let's say I granted the granted the confusion and Marcus is just confused, but ultimately he agrees with what we're saying. Let's say I granted that. Marcus has given false prophecies to which he has justified, hasn't really answered. Or let me say, he he's justified. He, um, what else? Um, his his views on work salvation, which we're going to get to in a second. There is it's not it's not just one issue with Marcus. That would be something else if we were dealing with one issue that he's just off online, right? Um, modalists teach, I see a lot of people asking, what is modalism? Modalism teaches that the father, son, and the spirit are not three distinct persons, but rather you have different modes of, uh, the person of God, right? There's only one person. So the father in creation, he, the father created all things. And then the son during the incarnation, that's so the, so you, so essentially you have God being the father at one point, uh, then the father. I mean, trying to be fair in language um, becomes the son. Um, and in the incarnation, that's the mode of God. So it would not be, you know, you know Jesus praying to a distinct person of the father. No, they, they, they would not have this distinction of personhood. Right. And so rather distinction of just role. So would it be like you? You come, you go to work, you're a construction worker. You take off the hat. Now you put on the dad hat. You come home, right? And then when you and your wife are spending time, now your husband hat, right? So that's how modalism treats the question. And just in case you think I'm being straw manning someone, right? You think I'm... Do you want to build a straw man? Marcus is going to give an analogy to this in a second. And ask if this is exactly what he says. But let's keep playing this say about that is I think that's where the confusion comes and you already said that in the beginning of the video the words that people use to describe the distinction uh sometimes is what causes people to argue but there's clearly a distinction mm -hmm. uh you know and the way that I think about it is you know uh, Adam was made in the image of God so I have my flesh I have my spirit I have my soul the notice he has his flesh spirit soul same person now I would be a I, I I would not hold to a trichotomy view of the, of the of the uh, person, but nevertheless, right? Um, the analogy I gave, right? Flesh, soul, spirit, same person. Marcus, he's. I don't like what starting with man and projecting that onto God as if that's how God must be, right? So people say, well, see, even we have body, soul, spirit. That must be how God works. No, you, you're starting. Your starting point is wrong. That is very anthropocentric rather than theocentric. Let's start with what the Bible teaches. The Bible talks about there being three distinct persons. Clearly, the father is not the son. He uses the plural pronouns. We, right? I was sent by the father. I mean, there's multiple. If Jesus was trying to say he was the same person as the father, you wouldn't use a plurality of pronouns to describe that, right? Um, so the Bible talks about there being three distinct persons. But yet those three distinct persons are all called God. Right. And so this is why, you know, people affirm the doctrine of the Trinity. But um, again, so, yeah, uh, let's let's keep uh, let's keep going here. Um, Clearly a distinction between how my flesh operates uh, from my soul and my spirit. But it's still me. So okay. that's how I think about it. 
and this is a cl this is a classic oneness um this is a classic oneness example this is a classic oneness example i see cephas saying did anyone in the old testament know about the trinity well let's start with what the whole bible teaches right let's let's let's, let's say i grant you that i would argue they did but let's say I grant you that. Why don't we start with all, all the Bible teaches, right? Because we don't want to use a progressive revelation, like if you believe that, and then say, well, since the, the people in the Old Testament didn't know about, we should go with the ignorance of this person, right? <laughs> no, that's. I think that would be asinine to do that. But nevertheless, uh, yeah, this is a classic one. This example, so but keep one going. One of the things that I that I that I said to uh, to Marcus earlier. Uh, and I, I've said this to you guys, and so it's not like that I'm just saying it's just to Marcus. I've said it to you guys, i said it to myself. Um, and I don't care who you are. Whenever we try to put it in words and as many words we try to clarify, as often as we try to give an anal analogy, then the analogy inevitably is going to fall apart. You cannot give a human, a earthly analogy to uh, the Trinity. Now, I, I believe Corey right there is... Um, refuting or confronting the analogy that Marcus gave. The problem is Marcus is shaking his head even though he just gave the analogy. Right? Even if he just gave even though he just gave the analogy, Marcus is like, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, this is why I say I, I man, I I I feel for the guy because I just I think he's confused, but in his confusion, he's teaching something dangerous. And don't worry, we're gonna get more into this issue. Uh, and, and, and let me say this, because doing a lot of talking about I want to talk about the bad, the ugly, and the good. I, I do think some good stuff happened out of this uh, interview, but I got to address what I disagree with. And as I told Corey, uh, I will I will be doing it. But we had a conversation and we said, can we talk for a minute? The Bible says. Yeah, we had to talk for a minute. <laughs> now, if you talk to Corey, you're going to be there for a minute. <laughs> so I'm, just, I'm just teasing my bro. Um, but as long as Marcus believes that they are distinct, yet at the same time equal and the same? How does that even make sense? Oh, here's a question that I think should have been asked. Marcus, do you believe the son has eternally existed alongside the father? Not as a thought, not as kind of indwelling in the father, but as his own conscious, distinct person. And when I say person, I don't mean a human person. Personhood does not refer to the humanness of something, but rather the personality. Every, uh, you know, dogs have personhood, right? Rocks don't have personhood, right? Everything has being, but not everything has personhood. So you got to make those distinct. I would want to explain these things to Marcus, right? I would want to explain these things, but I would want to know that question. Marcus, does the, does the son, the father, and the spirit, are they distinct eternally? Meaning there's not some morphing that comes out of the father and then you kind of have this amoeba split and now you got the son. Because that's what we've heard explained. That's what we heard explained with him and William Jackson on that very strange interview. You guys remember that discussion? Yeah, 15, 15 what was it? 1,500 miles wide and high. We got to we got to have we got to have some of those things be answered. And it's not to just be a bully to Marcus. It's not, you know, but it's like Marcus, man, you're a teacher. You know, if Marcus is changing his doctrine, I think Mar Marcus should have a seat until he has some of these things worked out. Like, like this is me trying to be gr gracious and fair with Marcus. Like, hey, Marcus, okay, if you're moving away from oneness and more to a more Trinitarian thought, you gotta, you, you may want to sit down. I think it would be beneficial for you to take a sabbatical until you work some of these things out. That's just, um, that's just me, right? How does that, it doesn't make sense. And it's, it's not supposed to make sense. You're a human being with a with a, a, a flawed human mind trying to explain. So for the seven-year-old, the eight-year-old, the 15-year-old, or anyone that just gave their life to or placed their faith in Christ, they can't explain the Trinity, just like nobody on the planet can adequately explain the Trinity. So I- Yeah, and I think that's the that's the point Corey actually gave a better response. Uh, an adequate, we, we can't give an infallible, right? Because we don't know all, all of God, but what we do know, what God has revealed, we can give a sufficient, answer to who God is. That's why I say it's not about giving a, uh, you know, what's the word I want to use? A, uh, yeah, infallible answer. It's about giving a sufficient answer. 
right? We can give a sufficient answer because God has sufficiently given revelation. And so I don't think this is an issue of Marcus being kind of the ignorant child, but rather he's been he's been very um, dogmatic in his denial of the Trinity throughout the years. And again, I'm I'm hopeful. I'm, I'm I want Marcus to to come to a theological grasp of orthodox teachings. I, I, I would be one of the first ones to say, hey, man, brother, come on in. <laughs> We've been waiting. Right. We've been waiting. We, we, we would we would we would sing this with Marcus. Jingle bells, jingle bells. I'm not going to hell. You know what I'm saying? We would sing that with Marcus. Can I get a can I get a hallelujah in the chat, somebody? You know, so I don't have this this gatekeeper of like Marcus is my eternal enemy. But there are some there are some issues that man, Marcus, like to or to those who affirm Marcus as a Christian, that's some major issues. Right? Um Yeah. I think that is an issue worth dealing with. Um, I think, though, for me to uh, uh, to you, Marcus, sometimes we can say something and we have to come back. So, you know what? I probably should, I could have worded it differently or said it some some other sort mm -hmm. of way. Um, there are there have been w when you made the statement about he was a thought. Um, yeah. Well, that sent everybody, you know, away to oh, wait, wait a minute. Marcus is going to hell. But then I started listening uh, to other times when you spoke about um, about God, about Jesus. Like, okay, well, that sounds good. That right here, we got to fix that, but that sounds good. And so it's possible a person can say something in an incorrect fashion. But I think what happens is, and you tell me if I'm, if I'm wrong, you say something, people jump on you. The natural tendency for you or anyone else is to be defensive, right? Mm -hmm. And then you get defensive and then it's more fuel for the folks that don't like Marcus to see, 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 look at his pride and so forth. I've done that. So would you would you think that, that that's a fair assessment? Uh, most definitely. And then I'm pretty sure you know that when uh, we have these like deeper conversations on a deeper level, I think that people, you know, the Bible says great is the mystery of godliness. And so I, I'm glad you brought that up. Now, Marcus has constantly used that verse to, to say, well, we great is the mystery well, that means we can't really know, right? Well, th that's not how the biblical authors use mystery, right? They use mystery as something that was hidden in the Old Testament that has now been revealed to us. So the very passage people use to say mystery, you know, no one can know, is actually a proof text of how we do now know. The gospel has been a mystery hidden in the ages, but is revealed to us, right? You know, I've, I've done I've done you know teachings on that word mystery uh, numerous times, uh, but we'll let them continue. Someone says, "Where is the Trinity in the Scripture?" Well, if your answer, if your question is, "Where is the word Trinity?" Of course, but neither is the Bible in there. There's numerous words you use about God that aren't in the Bible. But the issue is, is the concept there? And absolutely, the Father, Son, Spirit—they're distinct from one another, but all said to be God. Very clear teaching in the Bible. Um, by the way, uh, if one of my mods could find this, me and Brother Rick Caldwell did a two-hour... Brother Rick, we may have to update that teaching. <laughs> we may have to update that uh, because we did a two-hour video literally going through the text, numerous passages on the Father, the Son, the Spirit, distinct, distinct from one another, and demonstrating how the Trinity is not some... Uh, Nicene invention, but rather a biblical revelation. We didn't quote church fathers. And while I love church fathers, I love early church history. We stuck to the text. And so if one of my mods can find that discussion, post it for those people asking, hey, where's the training in the Bible? I hope you will do the actual uh, work to listen to uh, a video uh, demonstrating the biblical revelation of the doctrine of the Trinity. So early in the video, when I was talking about, uh, you know, was Jesus a thought? That's it wasn't that I was saying that Jesus was a thought because the argument always comes down to, you know, people want. I mean, that's exactly what you were watching. The video he's referring to is the band carts discussion. Uh, it's a four hour debate and I watched it all. I gave a review of it, a lot of review of it. Um, and Marcus was more steeped 
more dogmatic in his modalism uh, back then. He's kind of softened on that. Um, let me see if Susie gets the right one. No, it's 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 the one with Rick Caldwell. If you, if you probably type in Rick Caldwell, that'll be that one. But Marcus was arguing that Jesus was literally a thought in the father's mind. If you go watch that, go watch that video. Type in Steve Bancart's Marcus Rogers. And I see one of the things I wish Marcus would say is like, OK, yeah, I was arguing that. But I, I moved away from that thought. But one, what, what he what he generally will do is say, well, I never said that or you guys mis misunderstood me. I mean, Marcus was saying like the father literally like cut his arm off and, and threw it into the son's body. It was it was strange doctrines. I mean, Stephen Bancarts was just laughing right uh, at some of the stuff because it was it was very confusing and, and just strange uh, theology that was in that in that debate they had. You no, know, well, what are we going to see in heaven to me personally? I don't believe that's a, a heaven or hell issue, but I was bringing up how the, the Bible says that uh, Jesus was in the bosom of the father, uh, you know, and the word became flesh. So that was where that came from. Um, but, you know, I've always believed that Jesus is God. I've never not believed that. Um, and so really that was what that, where um, that came. In that Stephen Bancart's video, Marcus literally said, again, if he changes theology, that's fine. But to say you never said that, I mean, I have a short of him saying, yeah, Jesus wasn't God, because if he was fully God, he people would have died on Earth right when he appeared. So, again, from that conversation, we were getting into, OK, well, what are we going to see when we get to heaven? You know, are we going to see, you know, three individuals, three consciousnesses, three spirits? Is there just going to be one on the throne? Is there going to be one on the throne and one seated at the right hand? You know, that's that's where it came from. But people took the clip. And, you know, they didn't take the context of it. No, I listened to the context of the, uh, yo. Oh, thank you. By the way, Rick posted that live. So make sure you check that out. Uh, two hour discussion on the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, so, but the issue actually isn't what are we going to see in heaven? It's what has God revealed now, right? Look, there's been debate about who we're going to see in heaven. Is it going to be the son only or the father and the son? I, again, you can have your view on that. I agree that particularly isn't a heaven and hell issue, but that's not what's actually at debate. Oftentimes what I've seen is Marcus will shift that to debate when that's actually not the focal point of the debate. And so you have to be uh, understanding of that. Um, but the question of is tongues needed to be saved came up. And let me just say this. I was woefully confused on the answer Marcus gave. Not because of some lack in my intellect, but let me ask you guys when you hear that when I play this clip, let me give me like 20 seconds. What is the actual answer? Because it, uh, Corey literally said, hey, are, is tongue necessary to be saved? And Marcus literally went on a six, six uh, minute answer without actually directly answering the question. Uh, you you believe that a person must speak in tongues to be saved? Or have you kind of changed a little bit on that? I would say I don't put people in hell, right? Because because Marcus has said, yes, you must speak in tongues to be saved. Matter of fact, you must get water baptized to be saved. And so Corey helps him out a bit, say, hey, or have you changed your theology on that? And Marcus first starts, well, I don't put people in hell over that. Well, I never, you never hear a direct question. I'm gonna keep playing a chunk of this. Um, like, like we were talking about before, right? It's by faith, right? So if let's say someone is on their deathbed and they decide to give their life to Christ in that moment, I believe that God is gonna honor their faith because- But we're not talking about deathbed conversions. Let's, the general experience is most people don't have deathbed conversions. Right now, if someone denies tongues for salvation, Marcus, is that person saved? Right. You never hear a clear answer. I'll, I'll keep playing for a little while. That is according to what they know. Right. But Jesus said, you're my disciples if you continue on in my words. So what I personally believe, this is how I present it to people, that tongues is for everybody. Right. And there's different types of tongues. Right. And obviously many people saw the conversation that um, I had with uh, Alan Parr, Mark 16, 17, these signs shall follow 
them that believe. It doesn't say some that believe. It says them that believe. I but then he answers questions like that, which he quotes a textual variant, Mark 16. It's actually not an original text. Big shock to a lot of people. Mark 16, 9 through 20 is a textual variant. But nevertheless, he uses to say, it seems like he's saying, yes, you must speak in tongues to be saved. So again, it's it's very confusing. I think if it said some that believe, that would be a different conversation. But in my name, shall they cast out devils and they shall speak with new tongues. And then the big one for me that I always uh, refer to um, as far as just using an example is Acts 19. Right. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. Right. So right there, we see that he's saying that they are disciples. They are believers. He said unto them, have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believe? And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be a Holy Ghost. So that goes back to what I would say about somebody on the deathbed. If faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Right. If mm -hmm. someone is just responding in faith, I believe that God is going to honor it if it's sincere. And I'm not going to say, oh, that person is going to hell because they didn't speak in tongues. And that's what I've always believed. And it's not my place to put nobody. Obviously, if you got some people. Let me say this. If the Bible says you must believe something to be saved, then it's, yeah, it's not our place. But we're just echoing what God says. Again, he goes on literally for, for four or five more minutes. And the answer never becomes more clear. I, if, if I'm just thinking if I was if I was talking to Marcus and I let him go on for about five minutes and I was like, so what's the answer? Because <laughs> I, 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 I'm listening. And I, I never hear a direct answer. I'll say that he did answer the question, to be fair, but it's never a direct question, which is what I struggle with. So, yes or no, is tongues necessary to be saved? Because he never he, again, he never really is direct with that with that question. But again, my point isn't to just be, um, you know, nitpicky for nitpicky sake. Uh, again, we have to go with what the Bible says. If the Bible says, hey, uh, this issue is for salvation, then we got to believe it. We don't have the luxury of saying, well, my personal opinion, you know what I'm saying? We, we, we don't we don't we don't have that luxury. My brother Rick Caldwell said, so Marcus Rogers believe that you must be water baptized by saying in, G in the name of Jesus. Yep, because that's classic modalist doctrine and teaches and, sp and speak in tongue. He extorts, he distorts what John 3 teaches. Yes, that is correct. That is correct. Um, yeah, yeah. My pastor says, why is only one part of Mark's longer ending a necessary fruit of salvation for all and not the rest of it? That's correct. Because you know what else the longer Mark, end of the Mark says? It talks about raising the dead, which they put very little emphasis on that, and being bitten by poisonous snakes and still surviving. So you want to know the tr And a lot of atheists have used that text because of, you know, a lot of charismatics want to overemphasize that passage. Well, bite a poisonous uh, snake or let a po poisonous snake bite you to see who's a true convert. And guess what? A lot of charismatics have died by being foolish, right? Unfortunately. Um, I remember seeing a video about a man praising with some snakes and got bit and had to go to the hospital. I think he died from that. But again, this is why I, I mean, it's not why I mean, historically, Mark, Mark 16, 9 through 20 is a longer ending. But again, there's some theological problems once you want to, you know, uh, get into the weeds of that. But um, let's see. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Okay. I'll do another clip because I do think there was some good. I do think there's, well, actually, let me, let me get one clip. <laughs> let me get some one more clip. Sorry that I disagree with. Um, we did. Cause I saw someone ask about, do we cover the Trinity? We did. We did. Uh, I think that, uh, Marcus believes what we believe in terms of the Trinity. He might not be ready to say the word Trinity, but he believes for the most part, there are some things that I think that even now Marcus he might explain like, okay, I hear what you said, but then that kind of made me doubt and that scratched my head. But then you come back over here. I, I get that. So on the basis of the Trinity, I don't believe that that is an issue that makes Marcus not a brother because I believe that he believes what we believe. He believes that Jesus is God. I promise you, 99% of you guys, if you began to start explaining, if I, if I said write a paper over the Trinity, you're going to get some marks taken off without question. But again, um, what you need to know, according to Jesus, 
is that Jesus is God. That that Jesus and Marcus believes that Jesus is God. He believes the Holy Spirit is God. Obviously, he believes God is God. And so and he doesn't believe that that God one moment is God the Father, one moment he's the Holy Spirit, one moment he he doesn't believe that. So we're good now. As Marcus fleshes this out, and as we give grace to Marcus to be like us, <laughs> which is kind of arrogant, uh, or as he gives grace for us to be like, as we give grace to each other to grow, then amen. Let me say this. I am not convinced from the analogy, mo the modalist answer he gave earlier, that Marcus believes what we believe, that is Trinitarians. I, I, I'm not convinced at all. Because I have never heard anything that is distinctly Trinitarian that Marcus has actually confessed. Again, this isn't to rag on Corey. Uh, now, because I've seen some people saying avoid Corey. Corey's a false teacher. OK, don't go. Don't go far like that. OK, <laughs> that's that's silly. But we're able to express disagreement. Uh, but no, I, I don't. Yeah, I don't believe we're all good now. Um he said something else. Oh, yeah, that Marcus doesn't believe that the father's the son, the son, the spirit. Again, I believe Marcus is so utterly confused on the issue. Sometimes Marcus will give distinct answers, distinct persons, and then sometimes he'll give modalist answers that they're the same person. I mean, the analogy of the, the soul, body, spirit, that's a modalist uh, answer. And so what do we do? What do we do with this? Right. What do we do with the false prophecies? What do we do with the, the, the there's, there's a lot of issues. Now, again, I, I told this to Corey, if Marcus is working out his doctrine, I don't think it should be done publicly. I believe Marcus should say, hey, I just need to sit back and hopefully he'll reach out to Corey and say, hey, um, I'm confused about some things. I'm misunderstanding some things. And they can have private conversations um, behind closed doors. Because let me just say this. I've had I've had about three or four phone calls with Marcus Rogers and they've all been cordial. They've all been cordial, never heated. And we've discussed some of these things, not as in depth as I would like, just because he's a busy person. Right. And I get it. But obviously, those a lot of those conversations will stay behind closed doors. I, I'm, I'm not big on <laughs> right uh, having private conversations and, and releasing them to the public. No, 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 no. But um, but yeah, I, I man, my my hope is that uh, Marcus will reach out to Corey because let me just say this. Here's the good, right? Here's the good. I've never seen Marcus as. Uh, what's the word? Unprideful, humble as this conversation. Think about all the conversations Marcus has had. With thou shalt not be named. Uh, Ruslan, Alan Parr. All the conversations were extremely heated and this was one of the first times i've seen marcus rogers almost in a learning position he was even sitting back and thinking you could see him trying to work things out now again i wish i would i wish the conversation would have been more distinctly about the trinity the nature of god right or uh, salvation by f faith right faith alone i wish the conversation would have been more distinctly about that and so I do. I did tell Corey, I appreciate the temperature. The temperature was at a great point. The, the, the temperature was at a great level. Right. But I do think the optics of everything had people believing that you were affirming Marcus Rogers. And I talked I talked to him on the phone today just for those who are coming coming in. And I said, hey, look, I'll clarify this issue. Corey stated, hey, I did not affirm him i do not affirm marcus rogers you put a gun in my head i probably would say he's not saved but till then he says i will treat him like a brother again i disagree with that but we have to be fair right because we don't want to be do you want to build a straw man we don't want to be straw man by the way if you're watching this video get those likes up get those likes up will said is the word trinity in the bible yes or no will is the word bible in the bible yes or no see if your argument is going to be well we can't believe anything Unless we see the word there, you're going to have a tough time because show me penal substitutionary atonement. Show me uh, omniscient. Show me, There's a lot of terms we use that the concept is there, but the term isn't. <laughs> Again, you don't want to use that argument because guess what? Now we have to reject the Bible because the Bible wasn't written. Nobody wrote the term Bible in Hebrew or you know what I mean? So you, you, that's a bad argument. That's a bad argument for why you accept anything. Uh, 
you know, d deny or, or affirm anything. Right. And so let's see, let me, let me, let me discuss some of the good. Let me discuss some of the good. Um, I thought this was a good point. I thought this was, a something to be hopeful about. Maybe I think it showed maybe Marcus is, is, I don't want to say changing his views, but willing to learn. So let's listen to this. Yep, I understand. I think, man, it would be awesome to bring Pastor Vlad on here because essentially what the argument is, there's a difference between the gift of tongues and then being filled with the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. That's essentially what the argument is coming mm -hmm. down to. Because if if you bring Vlad and you bring Pagani, they'll they'll make that distinction between the two. And I think that's where it would be a good conversation to have. But I understand, I definitely understand your perspective. What I would like for you to do is definitely send me the the plug for that Greek. Hebrew Bible, oh, well, I'll go, I'll go is, read it, I'll go study this is, it. Well, what sure. this is, this is Accordance Bible Software. I use Logos also, but on online, live, I have this because it just shows up better. I can go from one passage to the next passage to the next passage and pull up my Hebrew. I got other little stuff that goes along with it or whatever. Uh, awesome. I think it's, I think it, it is, it is. And, and it's just good. So when I, when I talk about something online, I want other people to see what I'm doing. And so this may seem like a minor point, but I can remember, um, uh, Cephas, this isn't about not wanting to see Marcus saved. We we just have a biblical standard, right? So we just don't allow everybody just to say, hey, they're saved. Well, we just ignore all their theology. See, that, that frustrates, frustrates me today. As long as someone says the word Jesus, people are like, we're good to go. Line them up. Let them be pastor next week. We're going to put them on the praise and worship team. And we're going to, we're going to, that's not how the Bible does it, right? The Bible has a standard for, for, for those who confess the faith. Because guess what? If, if you use the standard of theology doesn't matter, guess what? Backdoor Jehovah's Witness, backdoor moment, Mormons, backdoor Roman Catholics, backdoor Islam. Because so one area you're saying ignore the doctrine with people I like, but then with people you don't like, you're saying, oh, no, theology matters now. That's inconsistent. To the people you love, to the people you don't like, we, we should treat them the same. Now, again, on a personal level, I like Marcus. I don't have anything wrong with him on a personal level. But the theological issues, because of what my Bible says, and I believe what the Bible says, I have to be consistent. I can't just accept whatever and just say, well, he has good fruit. Because guess what? A Mormon has good fruit. And what generally people mean by that is they're doing a lot of things in the name of religiosity. Again, that's a subjective standard because guess what? Someone may say that to a Roman Catholic. They have good fruit. That's not the standard. <laughs> Again, we have to judge not only the character, but the theology. Right. Um, I was going somewhere there. So let me get back to this point. I enjoyed that because um and and will it's not about using the word i don't care if marcus don't use the word he denies the concept he denies the doctrine of it you don't have to use any theological term right that's not that's never been my point that's never been anyone's point that i know of but to this point again i i enjoy this point because by the end of this discussion marcus is actually um Asking for Greek and Hebrew resources. Now, if you follow some of my critiques of him, of Marcus, he's in the past kind of dogged Greek and Hebrew uh, sources and intellectualness, right? And, and theological rigor. And so I don't know. I don't know what's happening with Marcus. Lord willing, he is changing his theology for the better, right? Lord willing. Lord willing. But as of now, his theology now, biblically, we are not someone that he can we can promote Marcus Rogers theology, his teachings, things like that. And so um, there's so much more that could be said that maybe I should say, but I want to reserve some of that. But um, I want to ask a question. I'm, I, let's see. Let's see. I'm going to start a poll because we have two options on what we can do next. Yeah, 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 Caldwell. They always going to attribute negative motives. How come theology doesn't matter when I express my theology? Theology matters now, right? You're just a Pharisee. 
<laughs> you see how that's inconsistent? If theology doesn't matter and someone's saved, why am I the unbelieving Pharisee? That makes no sense. Stay consistent with your unbiblical theology, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, to me, that may make sense. We're going to ignore all the imperfect theology until it's something I don't like. Or you can just be what, do what I'm saying. Consider th unbiblical theologies, examine it, and do what the Bible says to do with whatever that unbiblical theology is, right? <laughs>